It's 4.30, so I think we can start this first ESG-related ECIIA webinar uh, with a very warm welcome to all of you joining. Uh, during the General Assembly we had in October 22, the ECIIA board declared ESG as one of the main hot topics in 2023. And in that same assembly, the National Institute asked us to make advocacy as our priority number one. And part of that is information sharing with everybody uh, within the IIA and also outside of the IIA. So we are very happy that so many of you have joined, uh, even also some uh, uh, participants who are not member of the IIA. Pascal van der Busche, our Secretary General, and Philippe Mokaar, board member and CEO of IFSC, prepared a one hour update on the European Sustainability Reporting Standards. And um, unfortunately, I have to leave at, at 10 after 5, so I apologize for that. Uh, but you're in very safe hands of Pascal and Philippe. So Pascal, over to you. Thank you, John. Good evening, everyone. Uh, before going in detail in the subject for today, I would like to invite all of you to use Slido to raise questions at the end of the webinar, but also to give us some updates during the webinar. So please download Slido and use the QR code that you can see here on the screen. This webinar is about the European Sustainability Reporting Standards, but I think it's important that we put first this uh, regulation into perspective. And as you know, everything started with the Green Deal. The Green Deal is well known, I think, from the society, especially uh, regarding the pollution emission reduction. But as you can see on this slide, it's not just about that. It's also about the sustainability of the businesses. It's about the financing of the sustainability and the transition. And it's also about the circular economy. But as mentioned, the main topic of the Green Deal is about the reduction of the gas emission. Uh, by 2050, we should have zero and we should reduce by 55% by 2030. And because this is the main topic, uh, there is a name for all these new regulation, which is called Fit for 25 package. In this Fit for 25 package, as you can see here, you have some regulation related to the gas emission, the energy business, the transformation of the energy, the use of the energy, but some regulations are more specific to the business, and this will be the topics for today, mainly what we call the CSRD, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, but also the CSDD, Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive. Besides the Commission, there are also some regulations that are more sectorial, and one of them is about uh, EBA, and uh, actually, uh, EBA has issued a, a roadmap on the sustainability issue. And in this roadmap, they have mentioned that they see ESG as a full integrated topic with the others. So it should be considered from the strategy of the bank to the business of the banks, to the culture, to the risk, to the process, to the control. Uh, I also invite you uh, on reviewing some of the ECB guidance uh, because ECB since last year has decided to review the implementation of the climate impact but also environmental uh, risk in the banks and they have issued uh, interesting documents that you can find on our website in the banking committee uh, section uh, where they describe what they have seen in the various banks in their review on climate and environmental risk. Last but not the least, the insurance sector is also busy with specific regulation through EOPA, but they are uh, a lot in line, I would say, with what is developing in the banking sector. They are a little bit later, but now there is, for the moment, uh, a consultation going on on the EOPA website 
about the uh, integration of environmental risk and sustainability in the business of the insurance company and undertakings. So a lot going on. The, the topic for sure, green is the color for sure for 2023, and not just European initiative here in Brussels, but also some sectorial one interesting for you to know. So we would like, first of all, before going in details, to know what do you know about this initiative? And more specifically, what do you know about the new standards that have been given to the Commission for review uh, at the end of last year and that will be uh, applicable very soon? So what we see for the moment, uh, we have about 50% of the participants that have answer the survey. Actually, what we see is that we have, if we take the number one and number two, it means that the majority of the people on the call today have no information, do not know anything about the standards, which is, I think, something very important for us as speakers to know in order to adapt to the level of details that you might expect. So this is, this is clear. I will wait maybe for one or two other seconds, but I think that the scheme is, is, is done and will not change. And I will now hand over uh, the floor to Philip, who will start explaining to you in details based on this pool what it is about. Philip, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, I'm not sure we will uh, we, we will detail the whole uh, ESRS uh, standards uh, today. This is uh, this is perhaps not our purpose today, but at least uh, uh, see what differs from the existing uh, uh, the existing directives and the existing uh, regulation, and and what will uh, what will be uh, uh, what will be the consequences for the uh, for the companies in uh, uh, in Europe. Uh, most of you may be familiar with the NFRD uh, directive, uh, the, which, which applies to the largest company in Europe. In fact, uh, the definition of a large company just changed uh, and is becoming very or pretty extensive now because it will concern uh, 50,000 companies uh, that will now fall under the uh, application scope of this uh, new CSRD and ESRS uh, uh, regulation. So this is far more than, than the group of companies uh, which was uh, concerned by the uh, NFRD. So the, ES the ESRS standards define in detail uh, what to report. And there is a number of new concepts that we should know and that we will know in the near future, such as double materiality uh, the double materiality analysis will support the definition of the scope of the report and this will be a very important step in applying the esrs we'll come back to that uh, in some minutes uh, one thing we should all know as well is that there are over 600 new data points uh, they call it data points to report comprising quantitative and qualitative data, which means intangible. And that means to, to give you to give you an idea, uh, financial reports comprises about 2000 data points. So this is between 600 and 900 new data points that companies will have to add to their existing uh, reporting, which is uh, quite, quite considerable. Something new as well is uh, forward looking uh, information that will be required on risks, on strategy, on how companies will implement the strategy and the risk that will uh, uh, occur. Something new as well is integrated reporting, which means the link that exists between the financial and the non financial information, which will be in this report. And finally, this report, this report will be digital. So these are the main differences uh, between uh, 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 the existing report and the, the, the new ESRS standards, uh, which fall under the CSRD uh, directive. So 50,000 50, companies. Uh, can we switch to the next slide, please? 
Okay. So this is uh, uh, the uh, uh, timetable uh, that will apply in the in the next couple of years. Uh, it all starts in 2025 uh, for NFRD companies. But what this means is that it will be a report. Uh, there will be a report in 2025 that will apply to the 2024 fiscal year, which means that by 2024, we'll have to very much know what the report will be in order to collect, uh, to consolidate, and to analyze uh, the data. In 2026, uh, other large companies, as per the definition we've just uh, viewed on the, on the previous slide, other large companies will have to report on their uh, uh, 2025 uh, fiscal year. Will be added in 2027, the listed SMEs on the fiscal year 2026 and we'll see that for these uh, uh, SMEs which are listed there will be a new set of standards that will be simplified uh, we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute too and finally in 2028 uh, non-EU companies with branches or subsidiaries in uh, uh, the EU so that is the uh, uh, the timetable for the implementation of the of the regulation. It is a very tight timetable because it means for large companies that they should be uh, they should be ready by 2024. In fact, so it leaves 2023 to adjust. Can we switch to the uh, next slide, please? Thank you. The uh, ES will come. will come now to the uh, to to the uh, yes the ESRS sorry uh, standards themselves, uh, and <laughs> this is the structure of how they've been uh, built. You've got three uh, three layers called sector agnostic, sector specific, and entity specific. Sector agnostic applies to all sector to, to all activity sectors, and these are the standards we will detail in a moment. There will be sectorial specific uh, uh, um, standards that will be specified. They will be they are uh, uh, being written right now, and they will be released later this year. So sector by sector, we will have specific standards to apply on top of sector agnostic standards and then entities will be able to report on their specific activities so that means that there will be a third layer a third possible layers that will apply to uh, entity specific activities three uh, three layers of reporting and then three reporting areas the strategy the governance the business model and the risk assessment is the first. The second is the implementation with target and metrics. And the third is performance achievements. Three, three reporting areas, three layers, three reporting areas, and then three topics, of course, E, S and G. This is the structure of the standards and the report, and the whole report will be based, as we've just said, on the double materiality assessment, which is a new concept that will detail, uh, and that is a very important concept because it will define the whole content, in fact, of the report. Can we switch to the next slide, please? This is the uh, uh, structure of the ESRS standards uh, as released by, uh, by uh, the EFRAG. So you could see that there are two cross-cutting standards that apply to everything. This is transversal. It goes to general principles and to governance, materiality assessment and requirements. And then you have the three E, S, and G topics. 
with a big focus on with five standards on environment, a large focus on social with three standards, and one standard on governance. You could see that there is an empty box here on the left. There was originally up to November two standards on governance, and it's been simplified momentarily uh, to one uh, standard only. And then you have all the appendices. So this is the structure of the new standards. Can we switch to the next slide, please? Thank you, Philippe. So oh, no. maybe let's go in some general principle that, that you already mentioned. So the first one is about double materiality. So what does it mean exactly? As you can see on this graph, uh, currently for the financial statements, we already speak about materiality, materiality of the financial statement. Tomorrow, we will add another dimension, which will be the sustainability impact on the company. So it's the same concept as the financial materiality, but it's about sustainability and the impact within the company. And the new, I think what is completely new, is the last layer, which is the company impact on the economy, on the environment, on the people outside outside the organization. So we will have the impact within the organization, but also the impact of the external aspects to the uh, organization. It is called uh, an impact materiality to make the difference with the financial materiality that we have today. We do not have any detailed or guidance today about how to assess this materiality this new materiality internally, but also the materiality from the external factors. But what is sure is that it's something very important that will need to be developed in the guidance, because as mentioned by Philip, in the ESRS 1, it's very clearly mentioned that all the information that will be reported will be based on this materiality assessment. And so this is the central, this is the starting point of the new requirements. And we know that EFRAC is working on some guidance, but unfortunately we cannot tell you when they will be available. And this is a, a central element. Another central element is regarding uh, the supply chain, because uh, in the supply chain, uh, we will uh, have to look at what is going on from upstream and from downstream. So that means that we will have to report information on the different risks that are on the customer side, on the supplier side. And if we think about it, it, it also means that the banks, to take this example, we need to ask some sustainability information to their clients. That means that it will not just be for the ones that are listed, it will not just be for the big companies, it will be for all the different companies. And that's the reason why, as mentioned by Philippe, we will have also some standards. EFRAG is also working on guidance for the small and medium enterprise that are not listed because this obligation for the big companies will have an impact on everyone as we are looking at the whole value chain from down and upstream. So I think this is an important information to share. And another one that I wanted uh, to share with you is regarding again this double materiality where we will have to define the impact of the external world on the environmental aspect, social aspect and governance aspect of the organization. That means that we will have to identify 
all these stakeholders, which is something completely new compared to what we do for the financial statements. And that means also that we will have to identify all of them because for the moment in the current standards, it's not very clear where the value chain stops. I mean, we know where it starts, it's the organization, but we don't know where it stops. So this is something again, that is a little bit uh, broad for the moment and that will need to be looked at uh, because it's, it's a big exercise that organization uh, will have to do. Now, if we speak about audit and, uh, and assurance, as you know, in the non-financial reporting directive that there was no obligation uh, to have assurance on the uh, non-financial information. It was just requested for the auditors to make sure that the information was available, except in some countries where they have decided to have some audit requirements, like in France, uh, if I'm right, Philippe. And now in the CSRD, uh, it is included the review by an accredited independent auditor or certifier for a limited assurance first. So this limited assurance will be uh, when the new regulation will be implemented, but it's already announced that this limited uh, assurance will be extended to a reasonable assurance in the very short term, they are speaking about 28 for the moment uh, in terms of application timing. What is also, uh, I think, uh, good to know is that the CSRD has been now uh, published on the 5th of January 2023, and the different member states have two years to translate it in their local regulation. So that means that the definition of this accredited independent auditor and the requirement for this auditor in terms of certification, skills and so on, will have to be defined by each member state in the coming two years. So this is in, in a nutshell uh, what I think we wanted to say. Do, do you want to add something, uh, Philippe? No, I, th I think you, 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 you uh, summarized it very well. Uh, perhaps uh, one word on the supply chain and where it stops. Uh, of course, we will have to wait uh, uh, for the FRAG and all the other bodies at the European level to, uh, to define it more precisely. But <clears throat> one piece, uh, 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 ultimately, uh, it will end uh, at the end of product's life. Because if I understand well, uh, uh, the goal is to put the circular economy economy in place. So that means that you will have to follow up on the product until the end of product's life. Uh, and then uh, uh, it, uh, it, it goes you know, as far as the, uh, as, as the product goes, actually. It's also uh, a big question about, for example, outsourcing, because already today we see the big problems uh, for the banks to, to, to audit the outsourcing of, of big organization. Uh, th this will be also part, I think, of the discussion because it, it will be part of the value chain. Absolutely. OK, so th thank you, Philippe, for, for your comments. May I give over the floor to you, John, to tell us what does it mean for the profession of internal audit, please? Yes, yes, please. And and um, let me first um, mention that in the meantime, we have 249 participants, which is already a great success. So, so thank you again. And I also need to apologize because I didn't introduce myself. My name is John Bandermacher and I'm currently the president of the ECIIA. And I'm basically uh, together with Pascal uh, hunting every stakeholder uh, close to us uh, to to advocate about uh, advocacy uh, about ESG as well and um, and what I will tell you is a little bit of that story the story that we go out with to all these these stakeholders uh, on this slide you see you see six boxes where uh, ESG really has impact uh, for the business uh, first of all of course ESG needs to be implemented into the strategy uh, and tactical goals and KPIs need to be set by the board uh, and and that of course needs to go into the strategy control cycle and that is something that many of us already are auditing. 
Um, looking at governance, it's it's really important that also the governance of a company is adjusted to ESG. I think about the skills and the composition of the board. Think about the remuneration that it needs to have ESG elements in it. But also the question who is responsible for ESG in the board? What committee will oversee that? Had that kind of questions, so it will have great impact. Um, if if the strategy is set and the goals are, are being uh, set as well, uh, the purpose and communication needs to be well communicated and not only externally uh, to show that the company really is, is taking this serious, uh, but also internally, because one thing is pretty clear uh, that ESG will need a culture shift within a company. Risk management is a very important um, um, division uh, and task within uh, this, this ESG area uh, because uh, uh, ESG will, will first need to have awareness uh, created with the board. And then, of course, uh, uh, when, when the ESG strategic objectives, objectives are set, uh, then risk management needs to do risk assessment and needs to embed basically ESG in the enterprise, enterprise wide risk management system. Um, operations and value chain, eh, it was already mentioned by, by both Philippe and, and Pascal, eh, the, the ESG will have impact on the day-to-day -day activities of a company eh, and, and uh, will impact operations. I think about uh, um, uh, goals that are set uh, with regard to pollution, use of energy and that kind of things will impact operations, but also the way we treat staff, eh, diversity, equality and that kind of things. And the very important thing is, of course, the downstream and upstream due diligence of the value chain, uh, which is really a very difficult topic to handle uh, for a company. And last but not least, the reporting and disclosure box. Uh, reporting needs to come from the business processes. It's no longer a question of at the end of the year asking for some data to report on, on, on GRI or ESG. It's about reporting coming from the business processes. And it's not only about data and results, it's about processes. Uh, if you look at the standards uh, that are drafted, reporting will be complex and very detailed. And as Philippe said, forward looking as well. And then the question is, who is responsible? Is it the CFO? Uh, because he is he's signing off on the annual report. Um, it should be transparent uh, because with greenwashing, we will not save the planet. And then the question, uh, is the external auditor prepared to provide assurance uh, and is the external auditor dependent on internal audit uh, for that task? And if so, can he rely on us or not? Um, and auditing non-financial information as we do already, uh, are we maybe instrumental for the external auditor to reach for the double materiality? All these questions will have impact and all these questions are on the table right now with, with, uh, with the stakeholders we discussed it with. So if we could go to the next slide, maybe Pascal, because that is basically um, um, what I already explained a little bit. The board has the new responsibilities and um, you can find it on our, on our website as well. But we, we wrote some guidance together with ECODA, the, the directors associations and FERMA, the risk manager, risk management associations, had to look at the roles that, that, that risk management and audit will have, but also the roles that the board will have, and uh, and also the question uh, whether oversight will be uh, uh, done by the audit committee or the risk committee, or maybe by a separate ESG committee. And that's a very interesting uh, question as well. Um, and I think the other parts I covered already in um, in my in, in what I said before. So maybe we can go to the next one because that is really looking at internal audit. And although ESG, we see it as a game changer with a big impact, certainly in the period of, of developing and implementing it, ultimately we feel that, that ESG for internal audit will be business as usual. If, um, uh, if you um, look at what, what the CEO of GRI recently published, he said ESG is nothing more than regular risk management. And uh, we believe that that, it, that it's true eh? because after development and embedding of ESG, it's just one of the strategic objectives. It needs to be defined in a roadmap with tactical plans and KPIs. Uh, and then uh, there are risks attached to achieving those objectives. And that's where it gets into our regular uh, uh, way of working. Uh, risk assessment needs to be done by risk uh, management. Risk appetite needs to be set, risk responses. 
So policies, procedures, processes, it all needs to be developed with ESG as a prominent element of it. Uh, some with specific ESG elements, but also many of them are having ESG impact on day to day processes. After all, it's not about the duty to report anymore, but about the duty to act. And if and when embedding is done, it will become part of the normal management control cycle of the normal reporting processes with controls to be monitored and tested and of course audited by internal audit business as usual. And in the financial industry and Pascal referred to that also had the ECB has issued uh, two, two uh, very good guidance papers uh, that, uh, that can also help other industries had uh, to look at a list of things uh, that will be impacted and a list of things that need to be audited uh, by us going forward. And, and on this slide, you see basically the roles that we define for ourselves. Uh, first of all, we can be the change agent. Uh, if awareness is not good enough in our company, we have the duty to raise that, to create it. And then depending on the maturity of, of risk management and, uh, and, and other tasks, uh, we can play an advisory role, uh, of course, staying out of the conflict of interest because the, the third bullet, assurance and insight, is, is our main task. And there we can basically look at everything connected to ESG. We can look at the approach that was taken. We can assess the risk assessment that was done. We can look at the embedding program uh, that, that the company used to embed it into the day-to-day -day practices. We can look at governance, risk management control. And very importantly, uh, we can look at the change of culture uh, because after all, uh, many of the ESG elements are in the behavior of, of management and employees. And since we are already performing a lot of work on non-financial information, and that is certainly one of the tasks that we can we can do. And there we get very close to the work of the external auditor. And we are at this moment discussing with the external auditors uh, how to align with, with their work. So, and that's indeed the next slide. Uh, in, in, uh, in providing assurance, uh, we, can, we can look at sustainability, uh, risk management and internal controls. We can validate the goals, the strategy, and the translation of those into the KPIs, and we can give insight in the implementation and embedding in the daily operation, and last but not least, indeed, the change of culture. So I think with that, um, I, I gave you a little bit of, of the insight of what we are advocating to our stakeholders and where we would like to be recognized uh, for, for doing this. Back to you, Pascal. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, I see that the time is running, so maybe you want uh, one or two conclusion words, uh, John, before we go to other details, uh, Philip and myself, before you leave us. Well, yeah, but well, maybe what I would what, would like to uh, to also uh, list, maybe uh, looking at the key messages that we give to our stakeholders, and uh, maybe it's important to mention that uh, that in the meetings we have with our peers, eh? we consider Ecoda and Ferma as our peers, but also with people from Accounts in Europe, uh, ACA, EFRAC and GRI. Eh? We try to make, make sure that internal audit will be part of the regulations. That's not easy, but if there is any foot to put between the door, we will do it and make sure that, that, that even in a small reference, we are there. Secondly, the three lines model, eh? it's really important that uh, the three lines model is recognized in all the regulations because that automatically brings the role to internal audit that we have. Uh, we also advocate the fact that it is basically based business as usual for internal audit and that many of the ESG related information is already audited by internal audit. Uh, and, and last but not least, we feel that the external auditor in providing reasonable assurance after a few years really needs to rely on internal audit uh, because we are basically auditing all year long many, many, many of the ESG elements. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you, John. Thank you for coming. Thank you. So now maybe it's time to give you a small update on what is going on in the rest of the world, because on this specific topic, ESG, I think that we may say that uh, Europe is in advance, but there were other initiatives. So Philip, could you please explain to us? Sure. Uh, in in a couple of words, uh, first, uh, uh, the ESRS, what we can say today is that the ESRS or the, the European standards uh, are the first stable set of standards. Uh, both ISSB 
and SEC are still under development. Uh, so we should be cautious about what I'm going to say, uh, but, uh, but this is the case anymore. Uh, the only thing stable that we know of is ESRS. Second, ESRS covers E, S and G, environment, social and governance, while both, to my knowledge, and as of today, uh, both ISSB and SEC uh, are meant to cover the environment side. Uh, so it will not touch the gov uh, governance or the social uh, side of the, of the reporting. Third, uh, on the uh, environment side, uh, we do not expect major differences between the three standards. Uh, what we know is probably uh, the uh, ESRS will be the most uh, detailed and the most pres prescriptive. Uh, what we also know is that the, uh, the standard setters should ensure that the standards are compatible uh, between uh, themselves. And finally, uh, 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 as it applies to uh, the environment, uh, ESRS seems to be the most detailed and prescriptive standards overall for now and as of today. <laughs> uh, so what it means is that the ESRS or following ESRS standards should allow uh, uh, organization for fast IS ISSB and SEC environmental reporting translation. So if you do uh, uh, ESRS, you should be able to translate to uh, ISSB and, and SEC. That's what the standard setters are telling us right now. Thank you, Philippe. V very clear. So we will see and, and follow up because, as you say, we hope it will be in line. If not, it will be interesting. Let's put it this way. All right. So um, before we, we go to the question and answer, uh, we would just like to tell you, first of all, do not worry. We will send you the slides uh, together with the recording. So yes, the slides will be available. And, and secondly, maybe uh, share with you some uh, useful documents that already exist and that you can you can download from uh, from ECIA website. So we have started end of last year what we call now the European Sustainability Reporting Standards Fact Sheet, where we try to summarize what's going on in terms of regulation, in terms of content, in terms of discussion with the, the various stakeholders. There is also uh, available on our website uh, a general video uh, explaining uh, the role of internal audit in, in, in a broad scale, I would say, not really uh, based on the standards, but in general, what can we do to save the planet? And uh, as, as mentioned by John, uh, there is uh, this publication uh, that we launched end of last year with ECODA, ECIA, ECIA and FERMA for the board members explaining what's the role of internal audit and, and risk management and how we can assist the board in this new oversight and, and new duties. Uh, we intend, of course, to, to go on with, with actions. Uh, so the monthly fact sheet uh, new will come along this year. We are also working on, on a video uh, to explain the standards on a very short notice so that uh, if needed, you could use it in your own organization. You could, uh, the National Institute could also use it and translate it, whatever you want to do. Uh, we are preparing some credential about uh, what is going on in some internal audit function by sector. So it will be very short uh, position paper. I would even say short paper, you know, some credential to share with you explaining what's going on. And as, as mentioned before, but very important, I think, uh, for the future, we have started also uh, working with uh, the different stakeholders here in Brussels, mainly the board of director, audit committee members, but also external auditor about the assurance and, and how we could work together, rely maybe on the work of each other, what could be done uh, in, in the future. Uh, and we will, of course, keep you updated on, on, this, on this work. And uh, last uh, but not the least, uh, there are also a lot uh, going on in terms of certification. And, and I think uh, Philippine is in a better position 
to tell you uh, what is going on at the national institute level. So, Philippe, the floor is yours. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, <laughs> generally speaking, uh, uh, I think ESRS is, is typically uh, what I believe institutes, our institutes, and, and the one I work for, uh, should make the most of what the ECIA is producing uh, uh, right now. Uh, in short, uh, what is our goal as institutes? Uh, uh, we should inform and train our members on this major topic. We should inform and train our main consultants uh, who actually work for the institutes and the volunteers uh, that are working for the institutes as well. And we should advocate the role of internal audit uh, in the transition projects and in the reporting. And this is precisely uh, what the uh, ECIA content can help us achieving. The ECIA is working on information materials, fact sheets, videos, and so forth. And the ECIA is working on advocacy material, uh, position papers that could help us uh, uh, achieving our, our objectives regarding the ESRS. In addition to what the uh, ECIA produces currently, uh, the uh, European institutes are working on training material or coordinate on training material. Um, and with the uh, IIA, so training materials in English should be available sometime in the, in, in the forthcoming months. And with the uh, IIA, uh, the uh, European institutes are working on an ESG certificate uh, that will be available later this year. So I very much uh, encourage national institutes to follow up what the ECIA is doing and to use the available content uh, for their local activity, for their local training uh, efforts, for their local advocacy uh, efforts. This is what I wanted uh, uh, to say to, uh, to all of you, and I, I believe it's important that we coordinate our efforts when it comes to such uh, important European projects. Pascal. Thank you very much, Philippe. I, I think it's time now for, for the Q&A, so please do not hesitate uh, to write the questions. So we have already uh, two questions. Uh, I will read it, first of all. So about the independent assurance provider, can that also be covered by a well-positioned internal audit function? Alternatively, what role can internal audit function fulfill? I, I will start maybe and, and you complement, uh, Philippe. If go you ahead, go ahead, Pascal. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so on, on this first question, if, if, if we look at the regulation on a theoretical point of view, uh, it, it's very broad because it's an independent uh, auditor. What does it mean independent? As, as I mentioned, uh, it has to be detailed by each member state and it might be different in each member state. That's the whole problem, as you know, of European directive is that most of the time they are quite general and then they are translated by the local uh, regulators in, in the local uh, regulation. And you might have discrepancies like, like the one we had already for the NF, NFRD, sorry, where three countries were different from the others in, in Europe. So on a very theoretical point of view, uh, the independent assurance provider, in theory, could be internal audit if if they fulf they fulfill sorry the different requirements that will be uh, defined by the different uh, member states. Looking at what happened on other topics and subject, I think that more realistically, what will happen, but I speak in, uh, under the control of, of you, Philippe, is that actually uh, internal audit will help the external auditor, will partner with the external auditor, will collaborate because they have a lot of internal information that is really useful and needed for such a broad subject as E, S and G. Uh, Th that would be my answer. And maybe a, a very last small point. Uh, I raised the question to, to the Commission during a meeting and, and their answer was that they do not want to limit 
uh, the market of this uh, independent uh, assurance provider to the statutory auditor. So th they are open to, to other options uh, depending on what the different member states will define. So that's the information that I have on my side. What about you, Philippe? Uh, no, I think you pretty much summarized it. I, I personally would guess that, uh, that there is a 99.99% .99 chance, uh, even more, <laughs> than, than uh, the internal auditors will not be in a position to, uh, to provide the reasonable assurance required. Um, we, <clears throat> what we should see is that uh, it is very much uh, the scheme that applies to the financial information that they are looking after, in fact. Uh, and the same scheme will be reproduced for the uh, uh, for the uh, non-financial information. As Pascal mentioned, uh, there is a new market uh, as uh, other actors will be able to enter the reasonable assurance uh, uh, market for the non-financial uh, 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 sector, so to speak. Uh, there is also a great chance, of course, that the, 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 the the major actors today uh, will position themselves into this market. Uh, reasonable assurance is, 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 is a big deal. Uh, Pascal mentioned that it would come uh, according to the current plans uh, around 2028. So that's really tomorrow. And this means for us uh, that we'll have to ensure that everything related to this new information, and I remind that, that there are uh, a lot of information, 600, nine, between 600 and 900, as I've heard, uh, that this information is collected, processed, uh, uh, consolidated, analyzed uh, with a very reliable uh, process. Uh, and that's where uh, we have a lot of work to do as internal auditors, ensuring that internal controls provide this reasonable assurance uh, before the uh, external auditors uh, come. Yeah, t t t thank you, Philippe. And uh, I think the last point of reflection on, on this first question is also that the non-financial information will be integrated with the financial information. So. Will it make sense to have two different actors for the assurance? Question mark. I, I just uh, closed the, the debate maybe there. Yeah. Uh, the, the second question is about how to advise the company. I, I, I think there is a indeed. Uh, thank you for the question, because I think that there is a huge timing issue. Why? Because first of all, if we think about the European sustainability reporting standard, so they are currently in the hands of the European Commission. And they will be official normally by June 2023, which means that the time left uh, to, to make the preparation and to, to get the information is very short. So what is the recommendation? The recommendation is, is to start yesterday, actually, uh, because it's not just about information to publish, but it, it's about for the companies that were not affected by the NFRD, it's 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 a real revolution, I think. For those that, that are already used to publish non-financial information, it's a transformation, it's more information, it's a format, blah, blah, blah. But for the others, it's a revolution and the revolution should start yesterday. I, th I think you're right. Uh, uh, if I may add, uh, Pascal, uh, in fact, yes, uh, they will be uh, validated in June, but we already normally unless there is a, a revolution uh, before <laughs> between today and June, we know what it what, what it's made of uh, because they have been published by the FRAG. So we already know uh, almost everything. So uh, yes, as, as Pascal said, uh, we, we should start uh, uh, yesterday. Um, yes, it is business as usual, as, as, uh, as was said uh, before by, by John. Uh, but there is a point or two points, actually, that we should take into account uh, nonetheless. Uh, the very fact that it's a whole new area of knowledge for most organizations, so that there is much to do in learning uh, what these standards are, actually, because we have to create and to implement uh, internal control around these, these uh, uh, KPIs. Uh, the second is that there will be everything uh, related to this reporting is compliance and it's great 
But the very sense, the very objective of all this is to support transition projects towards, uh, as Pascal said at the beginning of this uh, of this discussion, uh, to support the transition towards a net zero uh, economy. And that will mean a lot of transition projects. Transition projects will be strategic, there will be vital projects, and they will be numerous at the same time. And these will be these will represent also a, 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 a very important work in volume, both in volume and in quality to achieve uh, by by uh, internal audit. So both combined means that, yes, it is business as usual, but also there will be a huge volume and a whole set of uh, a whole knowledge area to master. So better be prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Philippe. So maybe we can switch to the next question that is asking if they will ask for a comparison. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm not sure about the answer because I guess also that the treatment will be different as it's a phasing implementation, as, as described by Philippe uh, early on. So first of all, the, the companies that were already uh, under the non-financial reporting directive obligation and then later on the others. Uh, I, I suspect for those that start for the first time, it will not be required, but I, I'm not sure. So I prefer not to say uh, something wrong. Do, do you know something about that, uh, Philippe? Uh, that's what I understood. That, that yeah. I understood yeah. that the first uh, fiscal year uh, uh, will be 2024 without historical. Yeah, that, that's, that's also my understanding. my understanding, but I haven't read it uh, officially anywhere, to be honest. Uh, the other question is about the mandatory topics that company needs to report on next to the copy topics coming out of double materiality assessment. Uh, I let you start this time, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my understanding is that uh, the uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, cross-cutting uh, standards uh, uh, are mandatory and afterwards in fact uh, what you should report on environment social and governance will be uh, left to the uh, materiality assessment it it would seem strange that there is absolutely no risk area in environmental social or governance uh, areas in organizations. So I assume that there will be a reporting <laughs> on environment, social and governance. Uh, the content will be guided by the result of the materiality uh, uh, assessment. But it, it would be very surprising if there is no risk and then you should not report anything at all. Be very surprising. Absolutely. Uh, just to complement, if, if I may, a very small uh, piece of information is that in, in the cross standards uh, ESRS 1, there is a very short list of compulsory topics, so whatever uh, the, the double materiality impact is, but it, it's very, very limited. So the whole approach is, is, is the one uh, exactly mentioned uh, by Philippe. And then we have a last question, Philip, about uh, what's the difference between a limited and a, and a reasonable assurance? Uh, <laughs> That's a question for external auditors, actually, <laughs> because they will explain to us exactly what they mean uh, by reasonable assurance on, on this type of data, and they still have to come up with uh, 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 an audit standard uh, on these uh, uh, standards, uh, actually. So I, I am not able to, to, uh, to, to, to tell you the truth. I'm not able to precisely define the difference today because there is no auditing standards published. But uh, what we can say is that these will require a strong uh, uh, internal control process uh, that 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 will uh, approve uh, uh, that these information that the, the organization will be produced are reliable and very much so. Ab absolutely. And I think what will be really interesting also uh, is that the, 
in 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 this reasonable assurance so it's it's much stronger than limited i think this is something we can say that's not a problem on that the scope is much bigger and it will be very interesting to know how they will give assurance on non qual quantitative information because there will be some qualitative information that that will be uh, mentioned so no, no figure uh, and and I'm, I'm really looking forward to to see what they expect for that and also what they expect in terms of uh, assumption that will be taken for the forward looking information which is also uh, quite new and, and especially because I don't think we have a lot of historical information. So it will be interesting uh, how, how to, to make sure that the assumption that I use are the right one. A lot, I think, of, of quite interesting topics. Uh, as mentioned by um, by John, uh, Accountancy Europe, so representing the External Auditor uh, Association here in Brussels, is working on, on, on this topic and has invited us at the table to, to discuss with them. But it, it's it's a long journey. It's a complex journey because it's a lot of information and it's new type of information compared to financial statement. So uh, th this is what we can say, I think, today. But uh, don't worry, we will, as soon as some direction are clear, we will organize webinar on, on the assurance process because I think it's important for all of us to understand uh, what's going on on, on, this, on this specific topic. What we perhaps, Pascal, what we could uh, add uh, <coughs> is what we've heard from the uh, from the FRAG, from the top of the FRAG, and what they say uh, uh, regarding this is they sh they 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 want to implement uh, a process uh, on non-financial information that very much looks like and the process that exists on financial information. So we don't know what it means in detail when it comes to provide a reasonable assurance, but it, we, we could have an idea by you know, transposing or translating from what we have in, in the financial uh, area. The second thing I wanted to add is that this is very true what you said, uh, Pascal. We, we, one can wonder how we will provide a reasonable assurance on intangibles and, 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 and qualitative data. Uh, that will be produced by by the organization and i think that's where specifically uh internal control and internal audit could play uh, an important role because there will probably be required an intimate knowledge of the organization uh, um, to produce and to verify this and to verify this uh, this this information that's where we can i think add uh, a lot of value when it comes to our cooperation with uh, with the external auditors. Abs absolutely, Philippe, and, and thank you very much. So time is running, so I think it's time for conclusion now. Uh, I, I see there were some other questions, but if you don't mind, we, we will answer them uh, in the material that we will be uh, sent to all the participants to finish on time. Philippe. I think one of the big message for today is that it's it's really time to start. If if you didn't look at all this new regulation coming, uh, it's it's really time. So please start. I think a second message that that you have heard a lot today is also that uh, it's it's a beautiful example of uh, advocacy of the role and the importance of internal audit with with the context of all this new uh, regulation and all this transformation of business process culture in in the organization so i i would invite all of us to to advocate about about the profession using this this new context uh, as an example because it, it's a it's a real big opportunity philip what would be your messages I would simply add very briefly uh, that uh, uh, I strongly encourage uh, uh, you to use the ECIA material, uh, spread the word. Uh, this is a very important topic. Uh, we have lots of things to do to, uh, to inform, to train uh, uh, our members, uh, our staff as well. So please use everything that is produced uh, by by the ECIA, translate it uh, as well, and uh, and 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 keep your your members informed. Thank you. So thank you to everyone, and we will keep you informed. And uh, 
we can already announce that there will be other webinars on, on, on this topic and all the best for all of you and, and a good evening from Brussels and Paris, I guess, Philippe. Paris. <laughs> Thank you very much for all of you. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Bye bye.